I'm Dr. Orion Taraban, and this is PsychHacks, Better Living Through Psychology. And the topic of today's short talk is understanding the symptom pool. Not a very exciting title, but a very interesting episode. Now, the symptom pool might be the single most important concept with respect to understanding mental illness. So if you think the modern world is nuts and you're curious to know how we got here, then this episode is for you. All right. To begin with, you have to understand that a person who is suffering internally in a non-visible way has a problem. This person needs to find ways to communicate that suffering to other people in a way that they can understand that is likely going to produce the level of care and concern appropriate to that degree of suffering. Now, you might think, well, what's wrong with using your words, Orion? Well, think about it. If I were to come up to you and say, I'm in a lot of pain and I feel very confused. My thoughts are so chaotic, I can barely make sense of them. And it's so intense that I don't think how much longer I can take it. You actually might not take me too seriously. That's because my statement is kind of paradoxical. If I really were in that much pain, and if my thoughts really were that chaotic, could I really talk about my situation in such a rational, cogent, and sensible way? The how of my message would undermine the what of my message. On the other hand, if I were to say, stop practicing basic hygiene, start spending all day in bed, and begin crying with no apparent provocation, would you really believe me if I told you with my words, I feel perfectly fine, never been better? Probably not. And that's because when the how and the what of a message are incongruent, almost everyone gives precedence to the how. So direct communication is useful to securing care and concern for certain degrees of suffering, but it doesn't work for more elevated degrees of suffering. The communication must be deviant enough to signal the presence of a significant problem, but often not so deviant as to cause others to have the sufferer locked up in a padded cell for his or her own good. The idea here is that people need to titrate their deviance from social norms to signal other people to render the appropriate degree of care and concern. And the way that this is done is through something called the symptom pool. The symptom pool is a collection of constantly evolving, culturally bound communication strategies for expressing different levels of suffering. Everyone influences the symptom pool, but no one controls it. What's more, few people consciously choose to manifest these symptoms. That is, very few people intentionally use these strategies instrumentally. We call these people malingerers. Rather, most people implement these strategies unconsciously, which is what is so fascinating. Sufferers are generally conscious of their symptoms, but they're not conscious of why these particular symptoms manifested as opposed to some other symptoms. The symptom pool is generally cultivated unintentionally and unconsciously at the population level, and the symptoms generally manifest unintentionally and unconsciously at the individual level. Now, these communication strategies are always connected to certain times and places, which is why we can kind of consider almost every form of mental illness to be a culturally bound syndrome. And this is also why we see, for lack of a better word, fads with respect to mental illness. Like, some ways of communicating distress come into favor in certain times and places, spread wildly, and then completely disappear. For example, there have been almost no cases of glove paralysis or neurasthesia or hysterical pregnancy for quite some time, despite the fact that all three of these conditions were extremely common in the 19th century. And this is very strange, of course, because if there were a clear biological or genetic correlate for these sorts of things, well, it's doubtful that those correlates would have been so completely weeded out of the gene pool over the last 100 years. Even more perplexing is the fact that, say, hysterical pregnancy was almost never seen in highly educated women, and neurasthesia was almost never seen in the working class. How a presumably biologically determined syndrome could have been influenced by class and education is rather peculiar, isn't it? But let's keep moving forward. Now, before I do that, 
If you're liking what you're hearing, please consider sending this episode to someone who might benefit from its message, because it's word of mouth referrals like this that really help to make the channel grow. You can also hit the thanks button, which is in the lower right-hand corner beneath this episode, and tip me in proportion to the value you feel you've derived from this message. I don't do product placements or endorsements, so this helps me keep the lights on. I really appreciate your support. Thank you. Okay, so in any given time and place, individuals have an unconscious understanding of how they need to behave in order to communicate that they are in sufficient emotional pain to motivate care and concern from others. But the thing is that we have to be very careful about this for two reasons. In the first place, we can inadvertently introduce ideas into the symptom pool that don't have to be there. And this, in turn, can unintentionally motivate people to manifest these symptoms in ways that we didn't intend. Ironically, one of the primary ways that this is done is through awareness campaigns. To illustrate how this works, I'm going to take an example from Ethan Waters' excellent book, Crazy Like Us, The Globalization of the American Psyche. It's very readable and highly relevant with respect to recent goings-on. The first chapter of this book looks at the rise of anorexia in Hong Kong in the 90s. Now, anorexia is a very serious disorder. Most people don't know this, but it actually has one of the highest fatality rates among all mental illnesses, higher even than depression. So it's something that needs to be taken seriously. It's also something that functionally does not exist in the developing world. Unfortunately, there are still people who are underfed and malnourished, But this is not because they are intentionally depriving themselves of food if there is food available. Anorexia is almost exclusively a disorder of privilege, affluence, and civilization. But where it exists, it can create a lot of devastation and misery. So in the 1990s, some well-meaning psychiatrists from the West came to Hong Kong on a mission. They had seen how dangerous and terrible anorexia could be, and they wanted to spread awareness of this issue so that it might be proactively prevented or at least treated appropriately. And what these folks would say is something like, anorexia is a rare but dangerous condition. It generally affects young people, especially young, educated, upper-class women. Perhaps you've heard about it because Celebrity X recently confessed that she struggled struggled with it in her past. In any case, this isn't something to be judged. It's something to be understood and cared for. And we're here to offer you the tools to do just that. Sounds reasonable enough, right? And well-meaning newspapers and media outlets did their part to spread the campaign of awareness far and wide. What a good deed. Now, what do you think happened? According to a newspaper at the time, anorexia, which was previously non-existent in Hong Kong, saw a 2,500% increase in the exact population the psychiatrist indicated in just a few short years. Incredible. Like, who could have predicted that would happen? Now, Sometimes people respond to this by saying, okay, well, maybe the awareness campaigns did their job, Orion, and they brought a previously unrecognized problem to light by making screening and diagnosis more accurate. And there may be some truth to that perspective. Like, I'm sure that happens from time to time. However, that can't possibly be the case here. By definition, anorectics must be more than 15% below the minimally normal weight for their height and age. And that's just not something that could have been hidden on that level. Like, oh, this is anorexia? I just thought my daughter was starving. Thank you for educating me on its proper name. Like, that almost certainly didn't happen. On the other hand, what almost certainly did happen is that you had a group of respected authorities, doctors in white coats with all the paraphernalia of scientific technology, talking directly to adolescents, saying that there is a rare, read, special condition that tends to inflict young women of status and privilege, like celebrities. Whether you are aware of it or not, part of what these psychiatrists were doing was educating young girls in how they can signal their membership in certain classes of society. Using all their power and authority, these doctors indelibly associated a certain communication strategy with a certain segment of the population, young, female, high status, in the symptom pool. They did this unconsciously and unintentionally, but they did so nonetheless. And while most of the girls who subsequently suffered from anorexia communicated their distress unconsciously and unintentionally, 
their suffering was real, regardless. This is the first way we have to be careful about the symptom pool. The second way has to do with secondary gain. Secondary gain is the positive side of suffering or the benefits that accrue to one's status as a victim. In this example, the doctors were adamant that these girls not be judged or criticized. Rather, they should be given special care, taken out of school if necessary, and healed with understanding therapies. These girls needed attention and consideration and should be praised for their courage and dedication for overcoming this dreadful disease. Again, I'm not saying that these girls in Hong Kong consciously thought to themselves, okay, I'm going to starve myself so people will pay attention to me and see me as a courageous high-status victim. None of this is conscious. That's the amazing thing about the symptom pool. All of this occurs unconsciously, both at the population level and the individual level. However, by conducting their awareness campaign in this manner, psychiatrists basically succeeded in significantly spreading a mental illness that up until then was kind of culturally bound to the civilized West. And of course, their message was all the more impactful because it targeted young people, children and adolescents, who, all other things being equal, are the most susceptible to arguments of authority and the benefits of secondary gain. So this was just one example. Waters offers several other well-documented examples in his book, so check it out if you're interested. And this kind of thing is by no means an historical artifact. It continues to go on in the present day. On some level, it may be unavoidable. However, it may also be mitigated, ironically, with awareness. Awareness about awareness, its benefits and its liabilities something to consider. What do you think? Does this fit with your own experience? Let me know in the comments below. And if you've gotten this far, you might as well like this episode and subscribe to this channel. You may also consider becoming a channel member with perks like the priority review of comments or booking a paid consultation. As always, thank you for listening.